So a few weeks ago, uh, I was doing a, an interview for a magazine, and the, and the reporter asked me, she goes, if 10-year-old Antonio was here today, and he looked at your life, what would he say? And I have never liked that question. When people ask you that, are they just trying to get to know you? Are they just curious? They're not. They have a veiled agenda. They want you to say, if 10-year-old me was here today looking at my life, they would realize I hadn't achieved any of their dreams, and they want you to say, you know, 10-year-old me would say I'm a failure. But I wasn't going to play that game. I wasn't going to play that game. I wasn't going to give up. I used the magical time travel abilities of my mind, and I went back to 1977, a little schoolroom in Bluntville, Tennessee, and my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Weaver, who I had a crush on, by the way. <laughs> She's looking at me going, 10-year-old Antonio? She really said that. 10-year-old Antonio, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I told her, I want to be a soldier, a sailor, a professional athlete. I want to be an archaeologist who digs up lost cities. I want to write books. I want to travel around the world. I want to trade stocks on Wall Street. I want to have my own TV show. I want to be in the movies. I want to work in a circus in Germany. <laughs> then I want to come back to America and I want to give inspirational speeches. And I want to play with a complete set of Captain America action figures. <laughs> like that. I was back in that room in Shanghai. And I was talking to that reporter instead of Mrs. Weaver, who I had a crush on. And I said to the reporter, I said, you know, if 10-year-old Antonio was here today, he'd probably say my life had turned out exactly the way he imagined it, because I'd done all those things. But I didn't want to sound too arrogant, so I did say, if 10-year-old Antonio was here today, he'd probably want to play with my action figures. <laughs> I hate it when people do that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, people will tell you that if you didn't achieve your dreams from when you were 10, that you're a failure. But if we followed the dreams we had when we were 10, all the girls would be school teachers and veterinarians for horses. And the boys would all be astronauts who drive race cars. Okay, any veterinarians in the room? Raise your hand. No? Any astronauts? Okay, so by that logic, you're an astronaut. <laughs> well, I fly places nobody else flies. <laughs> okay, can you get back though? That's the important thing. <laughs> so by that logic, we are all failures. But realistically, I want you to think. Think back to when you were 10. Think back to when you were 10. Did you have a dream? Of course you did. And if you had followed that dream, would you have the same spouse today? Would you have the same children? Would you have the same life? Or... Would your life be a complete mess? Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen, you dodged a bullet. You're a success. You know, our dreams that we have when we're 10, very different than what we're going to have later in life. And I've had dreams my whole life. You know, when I was 12 years old, I started competing in sports. And I said, I want to go to college on a sports scholarship, I want to be a professional athlete, and I want to go to the Olympics. Okay, well, I never made it to the Olympics. But I did go to college on a wrestling scholarship. And I was a professional athlete twice in my life. And I've had people say to me, well, it's easy for you to get up there and talk to us about achieving your dreams because you achieved yours. Well, that's true, ladies and gentlemen, but I think I should tell you, the sports scholarship that I won was for my PhD. And the first day I set foot on that wrestling mat at the university, I was 46 years old. So I guess by that logic, I was a failure until I was 46 years old. Now the first takeaway I'd like to give you today is this, in addition to the obvious one, which is, you're never too old. The other thing I want to give you is this, you define your success, not someone else. You decide what's important to you and how you're going to define your success. You don't let anyone else dictate that to you. Now, as we go through life, our dreams will change. They'll take us here, they'll take us there. But the first rule to achieving your dreams is that you have to step on the road that will take you there. And I'm going to tell you right now, and I think most of you know this, the road that you think will take you to your dreams may not actually take you there. It may not take you to your dream, but it will take you somewhere. And, and I think we all know that if you sit on the couch, your dream is definitely not coming to you. So you get on the road, 
You take it where it goes, and at least you'll be moving. And movement is change. And change, just another word for opportunity. Now, I've been living in China for the last five years, and the Chinese have a saying. They say, one often meets his destiny on the road that he takes to avoid it. And I wish I could tell you I learned that when I was living in the Shaolin Temple studying with the monks. And I did live in the Shaolin Temple, and I did live with the monks, and I did learn a lot of things from that. But that saying I learned from the movie Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> And in the movie, the evil snow leopard, Tai Long, says to the hero, Po, he says, How can you defeat me? You're a big fat panda. And Po, the kung fu panda, looks at him and says, I'm not a big fat panda. I'm the big fat panda. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, be the big fat panda. Whatever you've got going for you, you just take it and go. We can't change who we are. If I could unzip myself, if I could be Anthony Robbins, if I could be Arnold Schwarzenegger, if I could be six foot four, charismatic, good looking, rich as hell, and married to a Kennedy, sorry I said hell, I'd probably do it. But we can't do that. So your options are sit on the couch, complain, wait for your dreams, or just go. Whatever you got, just go. And, I, and one of the biggest things I try and tell people, and I go around the world talking to people, and I find that so many people believe that they're broken. They believe there's something about them that, that would prevent them from achieving their dreams. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're not broken. You know, a pessimist is going to tell you, you're wonderful. I'm sorry, an optimist is going to tell you, you're wonderful, you're great, just go out there, get your dreams, this and that. I'm a pessimist, that's what I'm going to tell you. You know what? You're not great. But it doesn't matter. You take what you got. You take what you got and you go and you'll achieve it and you'll do it. Now, one of my biggest heroes... One of my biggest business heroes is a man who lived with the opportunity. His name is Paul Orfila. And anybody know who that is? No. Okay, good. But you know his company, Kinko's Coffees. Kinko's. And he's the founder of Kinko's. My brother gave me his biography for my birthday one year, and it's called Copy This. <laughs> Being a young Italian-American, I really liked it. So I was like, hey, copy this. <laughs> or, you can't copy this. <laughs> the reason he gave me the book, though, is because Paul Orfel and I share a commonality. We're both learning disabled. So when I was reading his book, I could relate to a lot of the things that he went through, and one of them was almost not graduating high school. And my high school GPA was a 1.9, and I graduated 30th from the bottom of my class in Bluntville, Tennessee. Why are you laughing at Blundville, Tennessee? <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at my business card today, it says PhD China MBA. Okay, so I got there. Paul Orfila got there too. So I'm reading his book, and there's so many things about being dyslexic. One of them is that we have a lot of trouble with spatial relationships. So I remember being in 10th grade. I'm sitting in Mrs. Holcomb's geometry class. First day of class, she says, picture a plane in space. And I couldn't. We have no spatial relationships ability. I can't, I don't know what that means, picture a plane in space. And the whole course was built on this one premise that I couldn't grasp. Every day going to geometry class was 45 minutes of torture. 45 minutes of sitting in a seat and feeling like I was an idiot. I didn't learn to tie my shoes until I was 14 years old. Okay, dyslexic people don't have good hand-eye coordination. They have a lot of trouble operating machinery. Didn't learn to drive a car until I was 20. I didn't ride a bicycle until I was in high school. Paul Orfila didn't learn to operate a copy machine. He was sitting in class, and he felt like a dummy, and I related to that. So he would leave the class and go walk around the campus and talk to pretty girls, which apparently he was good at. <laughs> And from talking to pretty girls, he found out that they needed photocopies. You know, it's on the university campus. They needed photocopies, and there was no place to make photocopies. So he got his dad to co-sign a loan, $5,000. He bought one machine, he rented a little shack in front of the university, and he installed a machine in there, and he opened his first copy shop. But guess what? He can't operate the machine. So he hires an employee to operate the machine. So then he's sitting there watching this guy make photocopies, and that wasn't very exciting. So what does he do? He goes back to the campus, walks around talking to pretty girls. 
And then they start telling him things like, oh, we need binding, we need collating, we need to... He didn't even know because he was such a terrible student. He didn't know what you do in classes. So he started adding all those services into Kinko's, and he built this huge corporation. Paul Orfila says that uh, he doesn't refer to dyslexia as a learning uh, disability. He calls it a learning opportunity. On some level, I will agree with him. I've always thought of, you know, dyslexia, the, the definition, the technical definition is that it's a perception problem. But I always thought of it as an alternative perception. And you see, sometimes when you're faced with a problem, if you look at it from another angle, you may see a solution that everybody else missed. Paul Orfila certainly did. And he said once, he said, if I knew how to operate that machine, I'd still be standing there today making photocopies in front of the university. But because he couldn't, because he was dyslexic, he built a multi-million dollar industry, which on some level is better. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, it's just like the Kung Fu Panda. You take what you got and you just go with it. Now, I have a lot of heroes, okay? Uh, I was very fortunate that my grandmother, who educated me, uh, just introduced me to the concept of heroes. And I have tons of heroes in all different in business, literature. Hemingway is one of my heroes. Captain America, of course. Rocky Balboa. I have a lot of heroes. And one commonality that they all have, they've all done different things, but one of them is persistence. One of my heroes is Thomas Edison, and I'm sure some of you have heard this story, but when Thomas Edison was trying to build the light bulb, the first 290 prototypes that he made failed. When he finally was successful and he made the light bulb, a reporter asked him, she said, after you failed 290 times, you know, what motivated you to keep going? And Thomas Edison said, I didn't fail 290 times to make a light bulb. I successfully proved 290 times how a light bulb is not made. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you define your success, not someone else. Now, one of my dreams since I was a little boy was that I wanted to write a book. And you've got to remember that I'm dyslexic, so I can't, for example, I can't copy. I, I, I know this probably sounds like madness to people if, if you're not dyslexic, but I tried to cheat on a spelling test once when I was in school. <laughs> and I came in with the, with, with the words written on a paper, and I can't copy. So I actually copied them all wrong, and the teacher caught me, and she said, you're cheating. And of course, kids, when you say you're cheating, they say, no, I'm not. no I wasn't. Yeah, that or my dog ate it. <laughs> I get confused. No, my dog ate it. No, uh, so I go, oh, I'm not cheating. And she looked at this list, and she looked at what I wrote, and she goes, I guess you're right. You weren't cheating. <laughs> all right? So coming from that and saying, you know, I really want to write a book. So my first book was rejected by publishers 79 times. I got a list of publishers. I started at A, worked my way to Z, sending out the query letters and getting back rejections. When I got to Z, what did I do? I started again at A. The second time I hit G, somebody finally went, okay, we'll publish your book. Persistence. But my sixth book was an assignment. A publisher called me and said, and I quote, our company would like to publish a book by Antonio Graceffo. And that book didn't make any money. <laughs> but we have to take our victories where we can get them. Mm -hmm. So, so much of succeeding in life, and you all know this, and, and, and please, I don't want anyone to think I'm talking down to you. I'm looking around this room. I see a lot of experience. Excuse me. I see a lot of experience, and I see a lot of people who have done something that other people dream about doing, which is starting your own business, which is stepping out there. And stepping out there is the first step, isn't it? You, you didn't make any sales before you started your business, right? It only comes after we stepped out there. But people are afraid to step out there. People are afraid to go outside. And this is what holds them back. I remember I was in third grade, and I went to my friend Robert's house, and I knocked on the door. I'm like, Robert, come out and play. And Robert goes, third grade. Robert says to me, no, it's cold and it's raining, and I'm worried I'll catch flu. Third grade, nine years old, he's worried he's going to catch flu. I said to him, and I remember saying this, I said, Robert, when we're 40, and I said 40 because I thought that was the oldest anybody would ever be. <laughs> I said, well, we're 40, I'm going to be out digging up some lost city, and you're going to be laying on the couch drinking a beer. 
And I spent most of my 30s and 40s in Asia climbing mountains, crossing deserts, writing books, living with uh, different tribes, and writing magazine articles. And once, I was on the dig for the lost city of Chang Seng, which sunk into a river between Thailand and Laos. And I remember the day that, it, that I was there, and it just, I suddenly, Robert, I made it. I made it. I'd achieved my dream. So I go back to the hotel that night, and I Google Robert. And I find out where he is and what he's doing. Remember Robert? I said he's going to be laying on the couch drinking a beer. You know what he was doing? He was head of a big accounting firm, making more money in a year than I'd make in a lifetime. We've got to take our victories where we can get them, right? <laughs> hey, he wasn't digging up a lost city. <laughs> so you define your success, and your success is based on your value system. So the question is this. Is it better to be the head of a big accounting firm on Long Island? Or is it better to be out digging up a lost city? I don't know. That's a question you have to answer for yourself. It's a question you must answer for yourself and to not let anybody else tell you. Because lots of people are going to tell you, hey, you're not head of a big accounting firm, so you're a failure. So one of the biggest influences I had in my life, you know, I use a lot of sports uh, imagery, but I started martial arts when I was 12 years old. And the reason why was family moved from here to Tennessee. I was the only Yankee in the school. Uh, I was the only Italian. I was the only this. I was the only that. I got beat up every day, so we started taking martial arts. So when I was about 14, 15 years old, summer of 1982, my older sister is still in New York. She calls me on the phone. She's so excited. I saw this movie. You have to see this movie. It's about you. This movie's about you. You've got to see it. Can anyone guess? Rocky, thank you. No, he's, he's my hero, though. The Karate Kid. Karate Kid. It was the Karate Kid. And I was the same age as Ralph Macchio. And he's from Huntington, and he's Italian, and he moves to a place far away, and people hate him, and they beat him up every day, and he learns martial arts. I was like, wow. This movie became a huge part of my, my childhood. So many, 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 many years later, I'm down and out in Manila. I scraped together just enough pesos to go see a movie. It's the remake of The Karate Kid. No, and it's also good. I liked it. So I go in there, and there's Jackie Chan playing the Mr. Miyagi character. And he tells Jaden Smith, who was playing the Ralph Macho character, he says, Life will knock you down, but you can choose to get up again. And I know everyone in this room, you've had your knockdowns, you've had your hits, right? Your ups and your downs, but you're still here. And that's it. And there's nothing else life can throw at you that's worse than that. You've already had it. It's just going to be more of the same, so you keep going. Now, another hero of mine is two-time heavyweight world boxing champion, Rocky Balboa. And in Rocky VI, he said, it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Now, in my PhD, my dissertation topic was Zhong Shi Swai Jiao Kua Wen Hua Bi Jiao, which in English means a cultural comparison of Western and Chinese wrestling. During my field research, I had to go do a lot of wrestling, obviously, but I also had to go learn some judo. And that led me to another hero, a man named Mashihiko Kimura, who many Japanese will tell you was the greatest judoka who ever lived. He held about 12 national titles and once went 20 years that he was not off his feet once, either in practice or in competition. The Japanese have a saying about Kimura. They say, no one before Kimura and no one after. Kimura's personal philosophy was, Seven times down, eight times up. You take the hits, and you keep moving forward. It's the only way. Now, I've done a lot of things in my life. You know, I've been in the movies, I've done TV shows, I've worked on Wall Street, I've done a lot of things. It's not one thing that's ever come naturally to me. Not one. You know, some people are born with talent. Or, let me rephrase that. I think we sometimes perceive some people is born, being born with talent. I don't know if there really are people that are born with talent. Maybe, maybe it's like 1% of the population. Most of us are born normal. And what do you think is the biggest determinant? I know everyone in here has had some sales training. What is the biggest determinant between the successful person and the failure? Handling Persistence. rejection. Oh, what did you say? Handling rejection. Okay, handling rejection, handling right, which is the same, right? You get rejected, you keep going. Persistence, you keep going. And that's it. Now, another thing I like to tell people is you're never too old. You're absolutely never too old. Your dreams that you haven't fulfilled up till now, you have not failed at fulfilling those dreams. 
they're on reserve. They're on reserve, and you're going to revisit them later. Now, some of my business heroes were older when they started their companies. Uh, Ray Kroc was 45 years old when he founded McDonald's. Mary Kay Ash was 43 years old when she started her cosmetics company. Uh, Captain America was 43 when he joined the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Sanders. Okay, he was in his 60s when he founded KFC. Now, he didn't actually found KFC. Colonel Sanders invented this chicken recipe. And he drove around in his car going to restaurants saying, I want to lease you this chicken recipe. And nobody would take it. And, and it was months and months, maybe even years, he was knocking on doors saying, look, I want to lease this chicken recipe to you. And he was sleeping in his car and living off his social security checks. And somewhere along the way, he met a group of investors who said, we're going to make this company called KFC. We're going to buy the recipe outright for you in exchange for shares in the company. And he stayed with KFC for a number of years. And then at some point, he sold out all of his ownership of KFC. It's in the, in the 1960s. And he sold it out for $2 million. And people said to him, are you crazy? Your share of KFC is worth much more than $2 million. You're a failure. And Colonel Sanders said to them, I am 74 years old. I have more money than I ever dreamed of. How much more do I need? Colonel Sanders defined his success. And it was based on his value system. And he was a much happier man as a result. Now, Ray Kroc is a really interesting story. Ray Kroc, McDonald's founder. Does anybody know what his job was? He's a blender salesman. Yeah, he was a milkshake machine salesman. Well, yeah, that's a career. Milkshake machine salesman driving around to restaurants trying to get them to buy his milkshake machine. And he finds this little restaurant run by the McDonald brothers, and he's just astounded at how efficiently it's run, how clean, how consistent. And he has this brilliant idea. Now, can you guess, was his brilliant idea, A, to start a franchise of, chi of uh, burger restaurants and make millions of dollars, or B, something else? Real estate. Real estate. No, that so wasn't the shape. original motivation. The original motivation was, I'm going to start this chain and sell milkshake machines to all the stores. And his goal, his dream, was to win Milkshake Machine Salesman of the Year Award. And ladies and gentlemen, he is a failure. <laughs> a movie coming out. What's that? A movie coming out about him. Is there a movie? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, he's one of my huge heroes. But I love that. He defined his success. And there's a really important lesson in that story, which is this. He started out with a certain goal. And it doesn't mean that you give up on your goals or you give up on your dreams, but you, you, life will sometimes teach you to redefine your dreams, which is the same reason why all the women in the room are not uh, veterinarians working on horses and the men are not astronauts, right? As we move through life, as we move through our career, then we will find ways that we wind up re-evaluating and redefining our success, and you have to do this. If, could, could, you, could you imagine if Ray Kroc was sitting there today feeling like a failure because he never won milkshake machine? Salesman of the Year Award. All right. So when you started your business, and, and most of you have your own business, and if you're in sales, at the end of the day, you're also that's also your own business. It doesn't matter. You work for a company, right? You're only as good as your last sale. It's the same thing. If you started a company, or you or you're in sales, when you first started it, I mean, were you picturing being wealthy like Warren Buffett? You know, you want to be a billionaire. Was that what you were picturing? And, and if it was, and I'm not saying that it was, but if it was, I want you to think about this. No, there's very few people on this earth that actually like money. The actual paper, the actual pieces of paper that you need that, that you want that, that that's your goal. That's not your goal. You have some value system in you. You have, you, you have some system inside of you that defines your dreams. For example, you want to provide for your children. You want to provide for your grandchildren. You want to... Uh, educate them. You want to take care of, of your spouse. You want to have a decent house. Maybe, in a, maybe even a nice house. Maybe uh, you want to fight for your retirement. You want that retirement to come at a reasonable age and under reasonable circumstances. And maybe you want to take a trip around the world. Is that billions of dollars? Could you redefine your goals? Could you sit down and say to yourself, what exactly is it that I want? And you may find out it's not here. You may find out it's here. And you might find, find out that you are very close. Very close to achieving what you wanted. What you really wanted. Rather than what you believed you wanted or what someone else told you that you wanted. Uh, 
I mentioned earlier that one of my heroes is, uh, is Rocky Balboa. You know, he won the title back when he was 36 years old. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say he's not real. This is true. But he has inspired me to become someone else's favorite fictional character. The real Rocky story, though, is this. Sylvester Stallone was just about homeless when he wrote the Rocky script. And he went to Hollywood, he's knocking on doors, trying to get people to buy the script. And a lot of people wanted to buy it, however, he had a caveat. I have to star in the movie. And he got doors slammed in his face, one after the other. And he's another one. He was born, born, born with a, a, a birth defect, a speech impediment. Uh, most people think, you know, when you hear him talk, you think he's not intelligent. He's actually very intelligent, but he comes off as being very unintelligent. For him to say, I'm going to write a movie, and then I'm going to go star in it. And also, he's like five foot two. And he's like, I'm going to go star in this movie where I'm the heavyweight champion in the world. He got all these doors slammed in his face. But he knew what he wanted, and he stuck with it. He stuck through the rejection, and he stuck with his value system, which was not to get money. He wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a famous actor. Do you know what he said? The second hardest thing he ever did in his life was turning down $50,000 for the Rocky script. And you have to remember, it was 1972, and he was just about homeless. The hardest thing he ever did turning down $250,000 for the Rocky script. $250,000 in 1972. It's an incredible amount of money, but he turned it down, and why? He knew what he wanted. He defined his success, his value system. He made a plan to get there. He took the necessary hits along the way. He stuck it out, and he achieved his goal. So if you like him or not, it's still an inspirational story. It's still something we can apply to our own lives. Now, another hero of mine, are there any boxing fans in the room? Good. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going I'm to ask the boxing fans not to answer this trivia question, okay? Okay, I, I'd rather have non-boxing fans. Who's the greatest boxer who ever lived? Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. And do you know how we know that Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, was the greatest boxer who ever lived? Because he told he us. Says so, there right. you go. <laughs> do you know that he actually copyrighted the name, the greatest of all time? He copyrighted that. I don't know how you can copyright that. He copyrighted that. Okay, something else about Muhammad Ali that you may or may not know is that he was a poet. And everybody's heard, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. You've heard that. Well, my favorite Muhammad Ali poem, his most inspirational poem, is also his shortest. It consists of two words. Me! Whee! <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I'm a school teacher, so before I go, I have to give you some homework, don't I? <laughs> so my homework for you tonight is this. You're going to go home tonight, you're going to take a piece of paper, and you're going to sit down at a table, and I want you to think back to when you were in, you were in your 20s. Because the dreams you had when you were 10, if you followed those, that's pretty destructive, right? <laughs> but if you follow the dreams from when you were 20, there might be something there that you've just always wanted to do. You know, you just always, when you were in your 20s, maybe you wanted to start a business. Congratulations. You did that. Okay? But you probably had some other dreams. Did you want to climb a mountain? You wanted to run a marathon? You wanted to take a trip around the world? Learn to speak French? Learn to play the saxophone? You play saxophone? See, he achieved his dream. <laughs> okay, so you may have had this type of dream when you were in your 20s, right? And you can write it down on a piece of paper. I want you to write it down. And remember, you didn't fail with that dream. It's just on reserve. You know, I've had people say to me, were you the best wrestler on the team? And I answer a question with a, with a question. I go, I'm sorry, you mean when I was 47 and the other guys were 20, was I the best wrestler on the team? Does it matter? <laughs> the success for me was that I got out there on that mat day after day. I fought and I wrestled with those guys. They liked me and respected me, and that's all I could have ever wished for. Yeah, and that's how I find my success. The same for you. And also, if you'd ask me when I was 43, are you, are you a, a failure because you hadn't wrestled on a you know, university team? That's okay. I did it when I was 46. The dream was on reserve. Right? Same for you. You got dreams on reserve. And there's a, psychologi a psychiatrist or psychologist? Psychoanalyst. Okay, psychoanalyst in the room. And I don't know, is this right? There's a lot of people that the biggest thing they're worried about is, oh, I don't know what to do with my life. All right, so for you guys, it's easy. Easy. You got a roadmap. All you got to do, you got to write down that dream from when you were 20. Start making the steps of how to get there. 
Now you know what to do with your lash. So, can I ask you, before I go, can I please ask you to just kind of sit up? Everybody sit up. Tall and straight and proud. Can I get, and even if you didn't think I was funny today, can I just get a big smile? Can I get a big smile? All right. Would you guys mind doing the me, we chant with me? All right. So this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to go one, two, three, and everyone's going to go, me! And then I'm going to give you the signal. This is the signal. And you're going to go, wait, okay? You ready? It's a two-part thing. we got to have the pause. I'm going to go one, two, three, me, we, okay? Ready? One, two, three, me, we. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.